Welcome to our second lesson in exploring Christianity. This lesson is going to deal with two basic parts. One is, why was the Bible written? And the second part is, why did Jesus have to die upon the cross for us? First of all, why was the Bible written? I want to take a look at a couple passages right now. And if you would turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 10 and in verse 23. Here's what Jeremiah says. I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. The other passage is in the book of Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16 and... In verse 25, there is a way which seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. Those passages tell us something that we actually see in real life on a daily basis. That is, man, on his own, with his own limited wisdom, doesn't have all the answers. That's one reason why God authored the Bible. That is, to help us understand how to live, how to please Him, uh, what is true, so that we don't have to go through life on a trial and error basis. Book of Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Here's what those passages say. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't guess what's on God's mind. We can't just know instinctively what the truth is. We have God up here and we're down here. God's infinite and we're finite. We're limited, God's unlimited. And the Bible is right in between us. It is God's way of reaching down and helping kind of bring us up to speed and instruct us as far as here's how you live, here's what will make life a better life for you, Here's how to be a better husband, or a father, a wife, a mother, or just a better person. There's something else I want to talk a little bit about, about why the Bible is written. Sometimes people get the idea that the Bible's written to kind of take all the fun out of life. And that's not true. I want to go back to the book of Deuteronomy and look at a passage there in chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, and in verse 24... The verse says, So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. That's an important passage. The Bible was written for our good. And there's a number of passages like that in the Bible. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's, let me give you another one in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start in about verse 10. There it says, Let him who means to love life and see good days. And who doesn't want that? I mean, the text says, Do you want to love life? Do you want to see good days? And I think all of us would say, Yeah, count me in. That's me. Then it says, Here's what you need to do. You need to refrain your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. That's a verse a lot like Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's telling us that the Bible was written not to take the fun out of our lives. The Bible was written so that we could have the best life possible. The Bible was written so that we don't mess up our life. The Bible was written so that we don't end up at some point in our life or at the end of our life with a lot of regret. The Bible was written so that we could live a, a meaningful, fulfilling life, the best life possible. To live a life that fits a man or woman created in God's image. So the Bible is an owner's manual. It's an owner's manual the Creator has given us. It's like a car manual that would tell you how often you need to change the oil in your car, all the specifications of the car. and the reason you follow that is not so that you won't have a fun in that car. The reason you follow the owner's manual is so that that car 
will give you the ultimate driving experience. It will last a long time and it will be enjoyable to have. And that's the reason the Bible's given to us. It is God's owner's manual to mankind. Now, in a future lesson, we're going to talk about, well, how do we know the Bible is the Word of God? We're going to talk about the evidences that back up the claim that it's inspired. But I want to address this one little issue right now, and that is, if you're listening to this, you probably believe in God already. If not, we have other series for that. But 96% of the people on this planet believe in God. And so the next question would be, what has God said? I mean, God's not going to go into all the effort to create this universe and mankind and then just kind of leave us all on our own. That doesn't make any sense. God would speak to us. God would communicate to us. And the question is, where is that communication found? And there's only a very limited number of books that claim to be God's Word, and the Bible is one of them. And so the Bible's an owner's manual for your life. The good news is you can stop living by trial and error. You can stop living by your own wits because I think probably if you listen, or you're listening now to the second lesson, you probably already realize that in trying to live by my own limited wisdom, I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble, and I'm looking for something that might be better. And that's what the Bible offers you. Okay, now we're going to transition. We're going to go to kind of a second part of the lesson here, and that is, why did Jesus have to die upon the cross for us? Well, let's go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. Now, maybe you haven't heard this word for a while, but the word is sin, and it's a word that some people don't like. But it's found in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. First, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of glory of God. If someone says, if someone says, or if you pick up the Bible and you start reading it, and you realize that the Bible, what the Bible is telling you is that you're a sinner, you need to, don't be angry. Don't feel like you're being picked on because guess what? Everyone else is a sinner too. And so you don't, you, don't, you don't have a corner on that market. That verse says all men have sinned and that's why all men need the good news of the gospel message and that's why Jesus died for all men. But there's another part of the passage and that is where it says and fall short of the glory of God. I want to talk about that a little bit. What is sin? Uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 says, sin is a transgression of God's law. That's what sin is. Sin is when you violate what the Bible says. But it goes a little deeper than that. The rules that are in the Bible are not just a list of arbitrary rules. It's not like God made the universe and God made man and then God said, well, he needs some rules, so we'll just... Well, here's some rules, and we're just those are the rules he lived by. The rules in the Bible are not arbitrary. The rules that are found in the Bible all go back to who God is. And that's what Romans 3.23 says, that sin is falling short of God's glory. God's glory is who he is. It's his nature. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. But he's also truthful. And he's selfless. And he's giving. When we don't live that way, for example, when we lie... We're not just violating some arbitrary rule, rather we're going against who He is. When we are selfish, again, we're not just violating some sort of rule out there, we're violating all that He stands for. Uh, when we manipulate people, when we don't forgive, and on and on. We're violating, we're going against who He is, and He happens to be the standard. And so the reason that God wants us to be truthful is because He's truthful. The reason that God wants us to honor other individuals is because He does that. The reason that He wants us to treat others with respect is because He treats people with respect. And so the very nature of God, the eternal nature of God, is what undergirds the morality that's revealed in the Scriptures. And when we violate that, we're not just violating some rule, we're actually opposing ourselves to who He is. We're challenging Him. And that's why sin is so bad. That's why Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, 
the wages of sin is death. That's not that you sin and you, you just fall over dead. The death in that passage is eternal death or separation from God, spiritual death. And that's what Isaiah chapter 59 teaches, verses 1 and 2. Sin separates us from God. When we sin, we no longer have a favorable relationship with God. Now, in Romans chapter 7 and in verse 9, Paul says, I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I die. What Paul is referring to is that when he was born into this world, he was born pure and innocent. But there became a time in his life that he was old enough to recognize right from wrong. He became accountable. He became accountable to God's law, and at some point he violated God's law. He understood that, and he understood it was wrong, and at that point he became a sinner. And so we're born into the world pure and innocent. But at some point in our lives, we know now what right and wrong is, and we choose to do evil. We act selfishly or we act arrogantly. We think we have a better idea than God has. And at that point we sin. And at that point we're separated from God. We're spiritually dead. If we die, if we die in that condition, then that's eternal death or the Bible, Jesus described that as being that's hell, a place of unquenchable fire and eternal misery. And we don't want to go there. And the good news is no one has to. Now, so why did Jesus have to die upon the cross for us? I want to go to the book of Luke chapter 7. And I want you to ask yourself a little bit, how do you view sin or how do you view evil? In the book of Luke chapter 7, I'm going to read a few passages here. So have your Bible open with me. Verse 36 of Luke 7. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, or he said privately in his own thoughts, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him that she is a sinner. Pharisee invited Jesus to go to lunch or dinner, and Jesus went. Jesus was a very sociable individual. Well, a notorious, well-known sinner shows up, a woman. Everyone knows what her reputation was. Well, she starts crying and, and anointing Jesus' feet and kissing him and things like that. And the Pharisee, the Pharisee said, well, if this man was really a holy man, he would not allow a sinner to touch him. And, of course, the Pharisee was wrong about that. But notice what Jesus says in response. Verse 40, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. You see, we can understand what the Bible says. Interpretation is not a big problem. Jesus responds, you've judged correctly. That's the right answer. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. She gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. He gave me no kiss or no... He, he, Simon had just ignored the customary acts of hospitality and greeting. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to her, her sins which are many. That's important. Jesus says, Simon, now you're right. She is a well-known sinner, and she has sinned quite a bit. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Now, I want to ask you a question about the two people in that story, the one who owed 500 and the other who owed 50. What was true of both of them? And you might say, well, they both owed something. That's true, but... There's something else they had in common. 
Did you notice, did you notice verse 42, when they were unable to repay? Did you see that? You see, the woman, the woman did have a big debt. She had a 500 denarii debt with God, a debt that she could not repay. But here's the point that Jesus was trying to get across to Simon. That woman may have sinned more often than Simon, but Simon had also sinned, and what Simon didn't realize is that he couldn't repay his debt either. Now, his debt may have only been 50 in the story, but the point is he couldn't even repay that. You see, a lot of people look at sin in this manner. I sin, but if I do a good deed, they cancel each other out and so I'm back to even. I sin, I do another good deed, or back to even. That's the way a lot of people view sin. And so they think like, well, I did something wrong today, but I'm going to go out and do a good deed, and that will make up for it. And we kind of live in a society like that, that you're allowed to make up for a lot of things. But that's not the way sin works. And in this story, we learn that. Certainly Simon had done a number of good deeds in his life. He was a Pharisee. He read Scripture. He prayed. He went to the synagogue. And so he was doing a lot of good deeds. But none of those good deeds had forgiven any of his sins. I want to go to another example. I want to go to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10, we encounter a Roman soldier by the name of Cornelius. And here's what the text says. Verse 1, now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Now here's a good moral man. Now this is a Roman soldier, but this Roman soldier is said to be devout, God-fearing, he was generous. He, he gave money to the Jewish people, and he wasn't even Jewish. The Jewish people really didn't like the Romans, but here was one Roman that the Jewish people did like. And he prayed, and he had an influence on his family. They did the same thing. Is the man saved? That's the question. Is Cornelius saved? And a lot of people look at Cornelius and say, oh, he's, he's fine. I mean, he's some people would say, well, he's better than a lot of church members, and that may be true as far as his morality. But the question is, did his good deeds save him? In verse 3, it says, About the ninth hour of the day he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come to him and said to him, Cornelius, fixing his gaze upon him, being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? He said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. Well, God is saying, Cornelius, I've heard your prayers. Send a messenger to Joppa, fetch a man by the name of Peter. Now, I want to skip over it. I want to move on to the next chapter, chapter 11, because chapter 11 retells the story. But I want to get a very important verse in chapter 11. In verse 13, when Peter shows up, Cornelius tells him that he had seen the angel, and the angel had told him to send to Joppa and bring Peter. And that's verse 13. But here's also something the angel had told him. Here's the reason why he needed to get Peter. Verse 14, Acts 11. And he, that is Peter, shall speak words to you, that is Cornelius, by which you will be saved. Cornelius wasn't saved. His alms and his prayers did not and had not forgiven any of his sins. And that's why Jesus had to die upon the cross if we were going to have the opportunity of eternal life. We just can't make up for our sins. We cannot pay them off. We cannot do extra good deeds. We can't do extra credit. We can't even die for our own sins. In the book of Ephesians, there's a couple passages that just really make this a, an emphatic point. 
Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. There, there's nothing I can do as far as extra credit or man-made sort of things in order to atone for my sins. That's how bad my sins are. And we need to come to terms with that. Um, sin is just not a mistake. Uh, sin is evil. It's selfish. It's, it's arrogant. It's we're going up against the Creator. It's, well, I got a better idea than God has. And so it's not just some cute little mistake or oops. It's evil. And they will destroy us. And they will condemn us. And such sins do deserve condemnation. And in, until we understand that, until we understand that, then the gospel message may not be too attractive to us. But we have to get to the point where we realize, as the jailer did in Acts 16, verse 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That is, outside of Christ, I'm doomed. I'm doomed and there is no hope. And I can't pay for this and no one else can pay for it either. And the only answer to this is the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many passages that make it clear that God is a just God. There are also an equal number of passages that make it clear that God is a merciful God and God does not want to see anyone lost. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish. There's God's wish. God's wish is that nobody perish, but then it says, but for all that come to repentance. So you have two sides of God. You have justice. And I hope, I hope you understand that God just can't pretend that we, you know, like I'm just going to pretend that I didn't see them do that. God can't do that. God can't just wipe sin under the rug or sweep it under the rug. He, can't, he cannot look the other way because he's a just God. And those acts of selfishness have to be punished. That's evil. And, and someone has to pay for that. So there's justice. I mean, we're not impressed by judges who let a criminal off and just say, well, try not to do it again. Someone has to pay for that crime. But on the, on the other hand, God doesn't want anyone to perish. And the question is, how is God going to remain just? Sins will be dealt with. Sins will be punished. And yet extend mercy to the sinner at the same time. And that's where the cross comes in. When Jesus died upon the cross, I hope we realize that he was suffering a death that we deserved. He was making atonement for the sins that we committed. There's a familiar verse in John chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's a couple points I want to make as we wind down the lesson today. First of all, Jesus died for everyone. And so, God has no favorites. Secondly, God wishes that all would repent, which means all can. Repent, repentance means you can change. And so, if, if you're sitting here today thinking like, well, this sounds really good, but I don't think I could live the Christian life, God says you can. I mean, God's not going to have Jesus die for all men if all men can't live the Christian life. So whatever you need to change in your life, you can change. Thousands and millions have changed your lives, and so can you. And God wants you saved just as much as anyone else. Then it says that whoever believes in Him, and hope you need to understand that that means more than just thinking in your heart, yeah, I guess there's a God, or... Yeah, I guess I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The faith that saves in the Bible is a faith that's obedience. It's a faith that moves a person to repent, moves a person to confess their faith in Christ, and moves a person to be baptized for the remission of their sins. Also, maybe you might run into individuals, or maybe you've thought this way in the past, that, well, I think I'm a pretty good person, and I think... I'll, I'll make it to heaven, and I don't think I really need to be a Christian. And what you need to understand, and maybe you've understood it already, is that that's an insult to God. 
To say that I can make it to heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ says that Jesus died then in vain or for no good reason. If God is going to send His only begotten Son into this world and allow Himself to be mocked and scourged and suffer a horrific death upon the cross, then what that tells us is that there was no other way. There was no other way to save man or give man the chance at eternal life other than the sacrifice of God's own Son. And to say that I could be saved in some other manner really is insulting to Jesus' death. When Jesus prayed in the garden, if it be with thy will, remove this cup from me, we read further that the cup of suffering was not removed. And that should tell us that there was no other way. And so as we close our class today, I hope we reflect a little bit more upon the, th the times where we violated God's word and we've sinned. We haven't done the right thing. We've been selfish or arrogant. That those were just not mistakes. We cannot just sweep those under the rug. But the Son of God had to die to remove those things, those evil deeds. Now, in further studies, we're going to look at what a person must do to be saved. And the church, we're going to look at how do we know the Bible is really the Word of God. We're going to look at what are, what are the expectations in the Christian life as far as morals and family and obligations as a Christian as far as worship is concerned. And so I hope you'll come back and join us again. Thank you.